All of us have different reasons why we got into open source. Um, I got into open source because I don't like walls. I don't like barriers. I don't like people telling me I can't do something. I got into open source because I like building things. I like creating things. And when I build something, I want everybody to have it. I want to share it. I want to give it. I want everybody else to be able to play in my playground. <clears throat> That's why I got into open source. There's nothing that I dislike more than walls, than barriers, than the rules that say you cannot play, you can't join. I've built this thing, I've created this thing, and I've given it to the world. The whole world can play, but now you can't join. You can't be a part of this. <clears throat> One of the walls that is built, built around open source is the money. How do we maintain it? How do we sustain it? We can sustain open source software through volunteer contributions. We can come together, we can collectively build things. But when we begin to reach scale, when we begin to get beyond the technology and into areas that touch into marketing, that touch into uh, organizational uh, systems, we need more than just volunteer contributions or if those contributions can be paid. So we put up more walls, we put up more barriers, we put up licenses that exclude, we put up different ways that we can um, <clears throat> exclude in order to make money, money to sustain the software. So we want to we want to think of another vision. What would it look like to be able to maintain open source software, and not just software in the stack, but big software focused on social problems at scale, and to do that through community. So I want to talk about funding. I want to talk about funding at scale. Enjoyed the conversation with the prototype fund. And a couple times in your talk, you said, there's no fund yet for the ongoing, long-term, committed maintaining of open source. And you're right. And that's a problem. I think it's a huge problem. I have children, um, made a choice to bring children into the world. Um, I have a responsibility, at least for a number of years, to make sure that that child is taken care of, that it is nourished, to maintain that life. We bring things into the world. It starts as an idea, starts as a, a vision, starts as a dream, it's a seed. And we build it, we love to build things. So we, we dream something up, we build it. Open source software is the same. We, we have a vision, we have a dream, there is a source, there is a person, they build it, all right? <clears throat> it might be a community that then comes around it, we've brought something into the world, and now we struggle. Um, I work for the uh, Digital Impact Alliance. My role for the last four years has been to help open source projects think about their long-term sustainability. So we've done a survey of our, um, of our clients. We've got about 500 open source projects. And ask one simple question. What do you struggle with the most? 97% said the same thing. We all know what it is. Money. We need money. So even though we might be part of communities where like, if we just organize it well enough and we get all the volunteer contributors together, at the end of the day, money still finds its way into these conversations. It ends up a lot of times being about money. So if we've brought something into the world, I brought my child into the world, I have some responsibility to maintain. Here's the question. Who is responsible to maintain open source projects? Who is responsible to maintain that which was brought into the world? I don't have clear answers for that, but I think there's a hint in where it came from, those who brought it into the world. So I want to share another source story. <clears throat> the open source software that we work with um, usually doesn't start with a technical foundation. It starts with a social ambition. 
It starts with trying to solve a global problem. Very often coming out of the UN system, coming out of international nonprofits, NGOs, there is a problem that needs to be solved, and technology is seen as part of the solution to that social problem. So we see the founding story a little bit different. So an example is we say there are no, um, there's, there's no appropriate hospital management system for small clinics in Africa. So th this is a missing thing in the market. Um, what do we want to do? The social mission is to be able to strengthen healthcare in Africa. How do we do it? We, we look and we see what's missing. Technology is often missing. We go out into the marketplace. We say, what's available? Nothing's available. So then we move into a phase where we need to, to build. And when we build, we choose to open source. We choose to open source because it's, it's, it's public money, it's public code. Um, and there's this commitment that we build something we share it. So, so the founding of many open source projects actually starts inside of uh, social organizations, social good organizations, inside of uh, nonprofits, NGOs, and universities. That's where we see um, a lot of this funding. The good thing about starting here is that they, they are funded. They are able to be funded as part of larger uh, programs. And, and we're, we're, we're talking in 10 million, $20 million kind of investments into a social program, some of that which goes to technology. So in, in, in our space, we are able to bring software into the world. We're able to build it. One of the challenges that, that, that we also have is that when you have a lot of money at the beginning, you can go out and you know, hire the best team to be able to do that. You don't have to do it yourself. You're not struggling in the basement trying to bring this thing into the world. You go out and you pay somebody to be able to build it. The second problem is that inside of many of these organizations, they are not software companies. They're do-good organizations. And so once these things are built, and a lot of investment into building pretty good technology, pretty good software, is that it's been built it's been paid for, and then it goes out into the market. <clears throat> the challenge that we begin to have here is that the, the, the way that the money came in at the beginning, through big investments, grant-based investments, they don't have a long-term vision for the entire life cycle of that software project. They also don't have an understanding of what it takes to maintain that in the, in the long run. So they put it out into the market and it struggles. Our program was set up to begin to think about how can we think about the long-term sustainability of this open source software, which was uh, built with great enthusiasm inside of the UN system, and yet struggles, struggles with sustainability. <clears throat> What we found is that um, for at least the first five or six years, we can go back to the same sources of funds and get some more money. But in about year five or year six, the money really starts to, to drop off in a, in, a fairly, in a fairly major way. And, I, and unfortunately, this is also at exactly the same phase when the users really start to kind of ramp up. So just when the project starts to be successful, um, as measured by its, its usage and what it was designed to do, is about the same time the money begins to to roll out. Um, so, what, so what do we do? What do we do? How do, how do we uh, maintain these software systems that have been brought in to the world? What if I got up here right now on the world stage and said, we are committing $1 billion euros pounds, whatever currency you want, they're kind of pretty close. But we're committing one billion for open source. Would we know how to spend it? What would we do with that? I've had conversations like, if I gave your open source project $10,000, what would you be able to do with it? And couldn't answer it. Like, oh, I, I, don't, I don't know. So let's imagine that there is, and there might very well B, very soon, as open source becomes much more critical to national governments, to the government strategies, um, <clears throat> that there might actually be funds of a large size, a scale that we're not used to seeing in the open source world. Will we be ready for it? That's my only call today, is that as the maintainers of open source, let's be ready. 
and believe for that day when there will be more money. I think I see a couple eyes saying, no, there's not ever going to be that big scale, but there might be. And if there is, what are the systems, the processes, the governance, and the, the ways to be able to, um, to mobilize communities to be able to do right-sized uh, and paid for contributions on the software that we all share and that are the uh, kind of cornerstone of a society that we want to see. What will that take? I don't, I don't have the answers. And that is why it's a call. Like, let's figure it out. And so I'm going to just leave that question and I want, I'll have my email at the end. I do want you to think about it today, a couple days. Just think about that problem. If there was a billion dollars flowing into open source, where would you spend it? Where would you go? How would you organize? How would you organize teams and communities and people? Um, the big challenge is, is what, how can you, as soon as you begin to put money into a community, and we've seen this, as soon as some people begin to get paid, what happens to the volunteer contributions? How do we keep the spirit of volunteering and, and con contributorship in a system that also needs money to be able to sustain it, not just to sustain it, to, but to be able to kind of reach to a higher level of scale. One of the challenges that we see here is, especially where we sit in, inside of the, the UN system, the, the world of bureaucracies, of centralized systems, is there's, there is rules about money. There's rules about um, being accountable to public funds. There is systems and processes that are already in place and there's no room for that for a developer who needs to work 10 hours to contribute to a piece of critical code. So how do we make that connection from the centralized control organization to the end nodes where people are actually doing the work? I think there needs to be something in between. I won't define what that thing is, but there needs to be something in between, some, a translator, some kind of an organizational structure that can still speak the world of the centralized, um, big money, accountability, old organizations, and our new decentralized future where sovereign individuals, where engineers, passionate software developers are able to work on the things that they love, build the things that they love, and, and have it all meshed together in, in a... Um, a vision for the, the future that is built on shared things, co-maintained things, things that are in the public um, sphere. Can we see software as a public good? Can we see it as a common resource where we're all finding our unique way to contribute to it? And the great thing about software is it connects up. How can we begin to see a future like this? So from where we sit in its different... Um, for others. We see a couple things that are, are kind of essential uh, for maintaining the open source projects that we see, which tend to be applications focused on a, a social uh, ambition. Um, <clears throat> the first is there needs to be some kind of a, a fiscal home. There needs to be um, an ability to, to pay people, an ability to enter into contracts, uh, to um, act in the best interest of the organization. There needs to be something legal. We have foundations. They already exist. We, we think there needs to be more models um, out there for shared uh, projects. The second is a primary maintainer. We all know this. Um, I, the way I look at a maintainer is the person who cares. The, the person who really cares, or the organization that cares. But it's somebody who actually kind of catches the vision, says, I am going to fight for this thing, this thing that we brought into the world that is good for humanity. I'm going to stick with it, and I am going to, um, I'm going to maintain this thing. Um, a dedicated product team. Um, this is probably more unique to our situation, where we see um, from the beginning um, companies being paid to build, uh, that we don't have, um, there's a lot of turnover in, in the, at least the software engineering talent, um, but to be able to, to keep uh, engineers engaged over the long term. Uh, access to long-term core funding. Now this one, this one is huge, um, and you know, as we heard earlier today, it doesn't yet exist. There isn't anywhere that I, I know of um, a real 
committed long term for as long as this project lives, um, there is some core financial support for it. What level that should be at, um, there's some debate. Um, we have some opinions, but it needs to be right-sized. And then the, the last is just kind of connection to a, a community of practice, um, to others who are doing the same. Let's connect this up. Um, I actually get to announce something uh, today um, that's been in the works for a while. Um, in terms of enthusiasm for creating a long-term uh, fund, the momentum, at least in our, our space, has been growing and growing. Um, and a number of, um, of international donors um, have put together something we are calling the Digital Public Goods Charter, uh, which is a year-long process um, to basically uh, define what we want to be able to fund, what we should fund, and it, after a year to be up on a big stage and ask countries uh, for commitments. Um, and those commitments can be in terms of funds, uh, they can be in terms of contributing software that's already been built. So a gov many, many governments are, uh, are building software for their own citizens. Can you give that to other countries? That's a contribution. Um, and then there's commitments for uh, collaboration. So this is, this is a real kind of global movement to kind of go into governments, to go into to world leaders, uh, to go into uh, major software companies and say, there actually should be this thing. And, and we're naming it and defining it as a digital public good, which is open source software that we all kind of use on, uh, that we rely on to be able to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And so that process is underway. Um, and there will be an ask for a fund, a long-term fund for, the, for open source. However, this is still a process. It is not here. And <clears throat> what we need to do here is to answer that earlier question. If there was a billion dollars, euros, pounds, other currency, for open source, how would we spend it? What would we do? We need to be ready for that time because from where I sit and what I, as I observe our ecosystem, if somebody said, we have a fund and it's at this level of scale because we think this is that important for the world that we should invest in it at that scale, right? The world government invests you know, billions and billions of dollars in, in social good. Why not in software? It's not as big a dream as we think it might be. But will we be ready? What are the systems, processes, governance, uh, funds, organizations that are in place? So my call to this group and to the greater open source community is to, to design it. Design it now. Design it this year and next year and believe that once there is a fund for the long-term core support, it needs something to flow through. There needs to be a logical money flow and governance system. Those systems must be in place. So that's my, that's my call today. That's all I'm gonna say. Um, happy to answer any questions, or even better, um, if you can keep it to like really short, tell us what we need to do to be ready for that billion dollars. Thank you very much, Heath. Thanks for your talk. <laughs> and now the question, are there any questions? Are there any ideas? <laughs> Actually, I have a question. Um, I think we, we are not ready for a billion dollars. We are not ready for a hundred thousand dollars. So I think uh, from my point of view, money actually is not the problem. Uh -huh. Um, and I was wondering, you, you, you said that you talked to open source uh, projects and you got 97% uh, saying that uh, money is the primary issue. So this, this doesn't re reflect my experience. Uh, I talked to people in the open source community, they, they, they wouldn't say money is the biggest problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell, tell us a little bit where this data comes from? What kind of projects these are? Yeah, and I'll also say that I think I'll, ag I'll agree with you. And it's, it's primarily a problem in, 
a challenge in, in organizing. Um, these, these projects are um, you know, social good projects. They're almost always uh, end applications, complete applications. Um, and they'll almost always require um, some activity that is beyond uh, software engineering. So for in the example of you know, a, a software for you know, ho hospitals in Africa, you have to have you know, doctors who are contributing. You have to have somebody who is uh, interfacing with the nonprofits and the NGOs in the countries, who is you know, flying and meeting with uh, ministries of health in different African countries. So there's, there's a whole bunch of extra activities. And I think, I, I think it is good to be clear that while this is open source software, it is it, ha it has a little bit of a different feel to a, let's just call it a technical only um, uh, application. Uh, so I think it's really a challenge on that scale, you know, if you have a billion dollars, maybe. Um, we fund open source projects and I talk to the projects and I ask them, what do you do with the money? And, and I can see various levels of, of you know, answers to that question. Like some are completely, is new for them. So they're like, uh, we um, will do some issues. We, yeah, we'll implement some more code. Thanks for the funding, uh -huh. right? And some are v very well organized and, and they will give you a list of their expenses of server costs of whatever expenses they have and they will give you a detailed list and say, this is where your money goes into, right? And so all levels in between. So to do this on a big scale and, and organized fashion, I think it will just be very difficult. So sorry, that wasn't really a question, yeah. and, and I can't give you an answer. But uh, you know, maybe it helps to collect from these projects what they need, and then sort of put that into some kind of framework. Right. I think <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. And there, as much as there's a problem with no money, there's a problem with too much money. Um, and so it's it's getting getting the right the right size, and then also just understanding like psychologically, what does money do to a community? Um, we need to be ready for that, because um, money is a funny thing. So for a lot of these problems, an important component of the problem is not software. And in fact, software is only a small component of the solution to the problem. So if you look at like um, medical systems, you're, you, have to, you have to host them somewhere, you have to run the software somewhere. If you look at payment systems, you need a payment network, and that goes well beyond just having a software that runs a payment network. Are you envisioning this $1 billion to be allocated only to software development, or are you imagining that this would uh, also fund the other pieces of some of these problems that are very software strong, I guess? I don't know, but yes. um, that, that aren't just software problems. Yes, I think it, it will be more the latter. Um, it, the funding could go to, to code, um, but it's, the, the, the reality is it's going to flow to the places where it can flow. And, um, and right now, that might be a healthcare-focused nonprofit who is out kind of doing the, the real-world work. So because the, they are already set up to be able to take money to... Um, to deploy it, they're they're the ones who are sending people to these meetings. Um, I actually imagine that most of the money will flow to that. It'll flow to things like, you know, trainings and certifications and uh, getting uh, governments equipped and ready to be able to uh, use this software. And that is again why I'm making this this charge to say, I want more of that money to flow to code at a right size, but it, we, I think, um, I think the code is the, the hardest part because it is, in, it is the decentralized community. It's much harder to flow money to a decentralized community than it is an existing single organization. 
And so that's why I want to put that focus and the call to us here to say, how can we figure out how to move money to a decentralized community? Like open source has showed us a hint of what it can be like to build things in community, to be able to contribute you know, without expecting you know, a financial gain. There's some really amazing, beautiful things in open source, and we don't want to lose that. And so that's what I want to figure out, is how can we create that money flow where we can, where we can take that, that big and standardized money and that there actually is a way where it can get to that one engineer who wants, to, he has four hours of code on this. Like, how can it, how can it split? Does that make sense? And yeah. I have one question. How do you deal with dependencies? Just for context, I used to manage the Rust project. And one thing that we see due to the massive scale of the community, we see a lot of money influx towards projects very much where the value gain is. So yeah. final products. But as a like the core of the whole thing, um, where you need to do, you basically do quality control for a whole ecosystem. It's really hard to argue, particularly to groups that do funding, um, we, have, we have actively tried to access funding, but there's been no part where we would even qualify because we're literally too deep. Um, how do you address that? Um, not well. I think, that's, I think this is you know, the, the, the core challenge. I think in our, our circumstance, it becomes even more exaggerated because most of the money that flows and already flows today without a commitment to, to funding core open source is that there are implementations. So to implement, you know, there was one country where they implemented the national ID system. It was, it was open source software. And I, I believe the tender was uh, close to $5 billion dollars to just in one country to, to roll out an ID system and can that does that money then f flow back to to the to the core project it it, it does not <laughs> unless so what are the what are the mechanisms to be able to capture and to trap um, while still allowing it to be kind of open and, and free I think that's the unanswered question so since you solicited suggestions um uh, one of the things that I think is critical for <clears throat> projects that you're targeting for long-term success is to have standard approaches around community building oh. so that you can say, here is a playbook for what you can do to help drive new community interest, to work with users, to help them understand how to use, how to take the step from being a user to a contributor providing mentorship structures for those users, that is a great way to spend money that pretty much every project wants to do and very few of them know how. Yeah, I'll take that. And if anybody wants to uh, talk through the rest of the afternoon, the topic I'm most interested in is how to have volunteer and paid contributors working on the same thing side by side while, all, while still simultaneously feeling uh, valued. That's uh, something that's of particular interest to me. So. Okay, there is one final question from an uh, online viewer, and um, it is, the process of the charter surely needs stakeholders with different backgrounds, coders, product developers, uh, and so on. How do you plan the process? Um, yes, there, there will be many, many stakeholders. There, um, you know, I, I say to kind of uh, stay, stay tuned, um, uh, there will be a website that's coming out, and it, it will have an ability uh, to uh, to get involved, uh, to make a connection to it from uh, a wide variety of, uh, of stakeholders. Okay. Um, thank you very much. So as you said, you're around for the rest of the day, so everyone can come and discuss further. And yes. then, uh, yeah, thanks again for your talk. Oh, and one more thing. These are the, these are the different initiatives that, um, that uh, run alongside this digital public uh, good movement. Most of them are housed. Um, in our organization. So check those out. There's ways to get involved. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.